came from and where are we going? Because we are going in their footsteps and Jesus is coming soon. And why is it important to study our church history? We all know this famous quote, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget the way the Lord has led us in his teaching in our past history. So last time we spoke about William Miller and how he started the first angel's message. And now we want to continue this evening. Who are some of the associates who worked with him? We want to speak about the Advent camp meetings, and we want to see what part do we have to play as we prepare for the Lord's soon coming. So William Miller's message was looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that he entered his work with trembling, and he led his hearers step step in the prophecy. You know, he was not a, a man who was excited and emotional, but he used reasoning powers as he studied scripture step by step. People were convinced in their intellect. They were not just excited emotionally. And I think that is very important to these days. You know, if we present a message and we get excited about this theory or that theory, uh, we can get emotionally excited, but we, the Lord wants us to be rooted and grounded in the truth. And so um, there is an interesting story about the monomaniac. Do you know what a monomaniac is? It is a person who has a mental illness, especially when they're limited in expression to one idea or one thought. They keep on speaking about the same topic over and over again. Well, the story was started in the town where Mil William Miller lived, that one day the doctor who lived there he said, you know, Miller is a good man. He's a monomaniac. All he can speak about is this Advent message. And so um, William Miller had a very interesting opportunity uh, to to see this doctor in his house. His daughter became sick. And so the doctor came over to his house and he was trying to help her with whatever was ailing her. And William Miller was sitting in the corner and the doctor says, so what are you, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? And William Miller said, I don't know, but I'm a monomaniac. So this is the same doctor who blamed him as the monomaniac. He said, I want you to examine me and see if I am so I can be cured. And so, so the doctor blushed because he was the one who started the gossip. And so, he, so Mil William said to him, so tell me, what is a monomaniac? He said, a monomaniac is, a rational, is rational on all subjects except one. When you touch that particular subject, he will become raving. Well, said Mr. Miller, I insist upon it that you see whether I'm a monomaniac. If I am, you shall prescribe a cure for me. He said, sit down right here with me for two hours while I present the subject of the second coming to you. And if I'm a monomaniac, by that time you're gonna discover it. So the doctor was caught. He didn't like the idea, but he sat there for two hours listening to William Miller tell about the prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. And he went step by step presenting it to him until the doctor, um, had to conclude that Miller's math was right, that Jesus should come in 1844. But he wasn't happy about it. And uh, after the study, the doctor settled back in his chair, he put on his hat, and he left the house in rage. He was furious that this was proven to him. But the next day, he knocked on Miller's door again. And he's, he was in such mental agony. He said, Mr. Miller, I'm going to hell. I have not slept a 
wink since you presented this message to me yesterday. He said, I have looked at the question in every light and the vision must terminate about 1843 AD. I am unprepared and I must go to hell. So William Miller calmed him down and spoke to him in, a, in about a week. He would come and visit Miller every single day until he found peace to his soul. And he went away rejoicing as an Adventist. So this is a beautiful story of the way William Miller worked, reasoning with people and looking for opportunity to share uh, the message. So how can we see here? So let's look at some of the preachers who joined William Miller. One of them was Joshua Himes. He heard Miller's lectures, and he asked him, do you really believe this doctrine about the second coming? And William Miller said, yes, I do. He said, why don't you tell it to the world? Miller said, what can I do? I'm just an old farmer. I was never a public speaker. I stand alone. He said, they like to have me preach and build up their churches, and that's the end. I need help. And so Himes was convinced that the Lord wants him to join William Miller. Do you know how old uh, Himes was when he joined William Miller? He was 30 years old. He was full of energy. He joined William, who was 60 years old at the time. They made a great team. Uh, Joshua Himes was a PR man, organizer. He was a promoter. He told Miller, Miller, get ready, doors will open in every city in the Union. A warning should go to the ends of the earth. So he published the first signs of the times. You know, we think of signs of the times being something Ellen White did and James White, but it was uh, Joshua Himes who started that publication. Hundreds of pamphlets and books were published, and he scheduled Miller to preach in New York, in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C. Did you know that even members of Congress came to hear Miller preach? Another preacher with a vision was Josiah Litch. He was a Methodist minister. He was sure he would overthrow Miller's arguments in five minutes. But after reading the book by Miller, before he finished, he saw it was his duty to preach the message. He published The Midnight Cry. This was a daily paper, printed a thousand copies and sold it on the streets. He helped with evangelistic meetings in Washington, Baltimore, and New York, and he also helped editing the Signs of the Times. Then there was Charles uh, Fitch and Hale. Uh, Charles Fitch was a congregational minister. He received a copy of Miller's lectures he carefully studied the Second Advent, accepted it. He preached sermons to local ministers. They mocked him because he was not ready. So he became discouraged. But later, Josiah Litch urged him to restudy the subject and combine it with sanctification, and he became a strong worker for the cause. So Fitch and Hale together to establish the famous 2300-day prophecy chart. They made 300 copies of this for all Adventist preachers. So when they would go and hold meetings, they would have this beautiful chart. So what were the results of this work of William Miller? He gave about 4,500 lectures in 12 years in nearly 1,000 different locations, large cities, towns, marketplaces, at, la at, last, at least 8 million copies of literature and papers were distributed. Hundreds were converted as a result of his teaching. So notice each preacher had a big vision for God's work to be finished. Do you have a vision? Do you have a vision for God's work? Do you have a small vision? Do you have a big vision or do you have no vision? What about me? Do we have a vision or are we asleep? That's the question. So as we know about Joshua Himes, he was a very diligent uh, worker 
And apparently, um, before 1844, before the autumn, he was baptizing a group of believers in frigid Lake Erie in New York on a cold, windy day. After he went to the house in wet clothes, he returned two more times to baptize more people. He had a cold, and he died at the age of 39. He left two children and a wife. But you know what? they were not sad because they said, Jesus will come, and we will see that again. So this was an extraordinary message with ordinary people. Joseph Bates was ministering to the slaves and to their owners, and the slaves were excited because soon there would be no more slaves, and they would go to heaven. And so um, it was interesting. You know, people would make fun of the message, and uh, Bates would not be discouraged. He said uh, someone was t telling them that they would ride them out of town on a rail. I'm not sure what that meant on a, on a train or I'm not sure what that meant. But Joseph Bates said, we're ready for that, sir. If you will put a saddle on it, we would rather ride than walk. You may not think that we came 600 miles through ice and snow at our own expense to give you the midnight cry without first counting the cost. And now, if the Lord has no more for us to do, we would gladly lie at the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay as anywhere else until the Lord comes. But if he has any more for us to do, you can't touch us. So they were not afraid to speak up and they were not easily discouraged. So who else did the Lord use to spread the message? It was lots of preachers, but there was John Lewis, a highly esteemed black preacher who worked in the South with the blacks. William Foy was a lecturer and preacher, also a black preacher who was very successful. But did you know there were women who were preaching the message? This was very interesting to me. One of them was Lucy Hersey. She and her father were invited to go to New York to tell the people there about the Advent message. When they got there, uh, she was supposed to speak because she knew a lot more about it than her father, but they were prejudiced for a woman to speak, so the host of the meeting asked her father to speak. But a miracle happened. He went up front, and when he was about to speak, he became speechless. So he couldn't speak. So then the father, then the host said to um, this young lady, Lucy Hersey, you go ahead and tell the story. And so she, they found a bigger auditorium and she spoke. And she was so successful in her ministry that several men who became Adventist preacher were converted as a result of her ministry. That is so encouraging. Another one was Olive Rice. She was converted to Millerism in 1842. She was convinced the Lord had something else for her to do than just to assist in prayer meetings. So by March of 1843, the Lord blessed her ministry with hundreds of conversions. And she knew people opposed her because she was a female, but she says, I dare not stop for the only reason that I'm a sister. So there was another lady, but we don't have time to speak about her. But let's speak about the children. Did you know the children were also working for the salvation of their friends and ad adults? They prayed for them. There was an interesting story about a little girl who came to a camp meeting in Buxton, Maine with her mother. She loved Jesus. She was waiting for Jesus to come to bed. There are no children, so they can hear this story here. And as she came to camp meeting, she brought her pink umbrella that she loved so much. But as she heard she must give up all for Jesus, uh, if she would meet him, she thought, do I have to give up my pink umbrella? So sitting in the meetings next to her mother, she struggled in her mind. I love my umbrella. I love Jesus. I love my umbrella. I love Jesus. So at last she cried out loud with tears running down her cheeks. Now everyone could hear her crying 
and speaking, she says, Jesus, I want to love you and go to heaven. Take away my sins. I give myself to you, umbrella and all. Then she hugged her mother and said, oh, mother, I'm so happy. For Jesus loves me and I love him better than my umbrella or anything else. You know, we don't think of it, but our children, our young people, they have the same struggles we do. And it may seem to us something small, but they're struggling so hard to surrender to the Lord. Well, the believers at the camp meeting rejoiced together with her. And among those who watched this little girl, there was another sad 12-year-old girl there, and her name was Ellen Harmon. Now, Ellen, as you all know this story, had happy childhood and she was not until she was nine years old when she had that terrible accident and when the girl threw the stone to her nose she fell to the ground bleeding and unconscious and she, her face was disfigured so much so that her father couldn't recognize her she was very weak and si sick she couldn't breathe through her nose she couldn't attend school they told her to go home she was dismissed you know, and so she knew Jesus loved her, but she she was depressed. She, she was she knew she had to go through life miserable, and she would wake up at night crying and praying for forgiveness of sins. At this camp meeting, and she, after hearing the sermons and the little girl's testimony, she was encouraged with hundreds of others. She went forward and gave her heart to the Lord. And as she was kneeling in prayer, uh, the burden of sin rolled from her shoulders and she was happy once again. So we sure can have an influence on others. So what were the results as they were preaching this message around the United States? Nearly all the doors of Protestant churches opened to them. Just think of it. If if we would do this work in the end, the Lord may open the same doors for us. You know, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, what others, give me other names. The Anglicans, I don't know, Catholics, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, you know, these churches of God, they all open the doors. Liquor dealers turned their shops into meeting rooms. Gambling halls were broken up. Infidels, deists. Universalists were changed. People who never attended church started attending. Prayer meetings were started in various locations. Almost every hour there were different prayer meetings. Businessmen came at noon for prayer and praise. The message convinced the understanding and aroused the conscience. This is very important. This is what we have to do. Convince the understanding, aroused the conscience through the Holy Spirit's help but not to bring emotionalism. So what about Adventist camp meetings? Have you ever been to a camp meeting that had four to 6,000 people? We just heard, where was this, 1,500? Rwanda, 1,500. Imagine four to 6,000 people in a camp meeting. Um, Miller is preaching the second coming the tent is huge, 120 feet. It easily sits four to 6,000. In May of 1842, they planned to hold three summer camp meetings, but the need was so great they had, had 31, 10 times more than they planned. That year, God was working mightily. In 19, eight, uh, no, in um, 18, uh, 33, they held 40 camp meetings. In, in 1844, 54 camp meetings. So how, wh what was the camp meeting like? Just think of it, uh, 4,000 to 600 um, people, no audiovisual equipment, no PowerPoint presentations, no TV, no amplification system. How could the people hear them? It's amazing. Um, the message was very straight. The, the Bible, the chart, and beautiful singing. They had a songbook. It was called the Millennial Harp. The message was, behold, 
the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So this is what Ellen White describes. The order of the meeting was simple. A short pointed message was given, then liberty was granted for general exhortation. There was a rule, the most perfect stillness possible for so large of a crowd. It's amazing. It was very quiet and reverent. The presence of the holy angels was felt in the assembly and numbers were daily added to the little band of believers. So this is how they were spreading the message. And I think we should take heed because there's, they had some great ideas. We're so far behind. I mean, I can't believe it. 170, what, eight years ago? Personal, personal consecration, what does that mean? What do you think that means? They had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They were on fire for the Lord. They would talk with others about religion and the second coming. They held Bible classes. They held social meetings for prayer and exhortation. Now, here's an interesting one. They questioned ministers on the second coming to get them to study. Now, this is something Brother Joe would do, I think. <laughs> so, you know, asking people thought-provoking questions. What else did they do? They circulated books. They circulated magazines. They did not murmur when they were opposed or mocked. They opened second advent libraries in every town. Did you hear of that? Opening a library in every town where people could go and sit and read some of Miller's uh, writings about the second coming and Bible verses. Um, they wrote letters to their friends. There was no internet. Just think of that. There was no uh, email, okay? They would write letters to their friends and relatives and attach the 2,300 day chart to the letter. Can you imagine that? And that's what's nailed in those days. You can imagine how many weeks that took, but how amazing. And they traveled far and near they used their own money, resources. I know Joshua Himes said he laid everything on the altar, his money, his family, himself, everything he had. So October 22nd, 1844 came. And what was Miller and the believers doing on that day that Jesus was to come? Miller was 52 years old. He used the day to rest from preaching. He said, I have preached 4,500 lectures in 12 years and at least 500,000 different, to at least 500,000 different people. Miller was home on his farm in Lowhampton, New York. While his friends, neighbors gathered nearby, he sat quietly on his porch waiting patiently until the sun went down on the western horizon. How disappointed they were. They were ridiculed. Curious troublemakers laughed at them, mocked them. Some of them draped themselves in white robes and leaped around on rooftops, acting like they were ascending to heaven. How do you handle that? Your neighbors are watching you. You were telling them Jesus is coming and he never came and you're still on this earth. What was it like facing neighbors again? Let's see here. So on October 22nd, 1844, it passed into history. Um, with it went the hopes and dreams of a sincere, honest multitude of people. Many never recovered from the shock of the disappointment but small groups studied their Bibles to discover where they had gone wrong. True, the disappointment was still there, but so was the hope of the soon coming Lord. So William Miller writes the day after the disappointment. The next day it seemed as though all the demons from the bottomless pit were loose upon us. 
The same people who were crying for mercy two days before were now mocking, scoffing, threatening in a blasphemous manner. So I can imagine the devil and his evil angels were there to discourage the people, the Advent people, and to mock them, just like they mocked Jesus. But was William Miller disappointed? It says here, although I have been twice disappointed I'm not yet cast down or discouraged God has been with me in spirit and has comforted me I have now much more evidence that I do believe in God's word and although surrounded with enemies and scoffers yet my mind is perfectly calm and my hope in the coming of Christ is as strong as ever how precious and so as you all know there was a voice from heaven on October 23rd, 1844. You know how merciful God is. He didn't let them wait one year or two years or 10 years, just one day after the disappointment. Hiram Edson was given an understanding of the meaning of the sanctuary in Daniel 8:14, And this is what he writes. After breakfast, I said to one of my brethren, let us go and see and encourage some of our brethren. I started um, walking, and while passing through a large field, I stopped about midway of the field. Heaven seemed open to my view, and I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to this earth on the tenth day of the seventh month, at the end of the 2300 days, he, for the first time, entered on that day into the second apartment of that sanctuary, and that he had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to this earth. How precious. And so, where did the believers who waited for the Lord's coming meet after the disappointment? They couldn't go to worship in the former churches as long as they believed in the second coming they started gathering in little companies. And so in 1848, William Miller built this small chapel on his property for the Millerites to worship in. And so here is the inside, that chapel. Now what happened to William Miller? Will we ever meet him again? Angels watch the precious dust of this servant of God and he will come forth at the sound of the trump. How precious. So we will meet him in heaven if we're faithful. Now what about us? What would you do if you believe that Jesus is coming in one year? We should be looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent feet. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So how can we hasten the coming of Jesus? It says be diligent. Do you know what the word diligent means? It's characterized by steady, earnest, energetic effort. This is the dictionary definition. Painstaking. Are we steady that means we don't give up we don't start to be excited about the lord's coming then we forget about it for a few weeks then then we start again you know on and off kind of no it's a steady earnest energetic effort preparing for jesus to come painstaking it's going to take some pain it's not going to be easy as heaven is working in preparing a people for his coming they're waiting for us to cooperate and be of light and are we daily inquiring Lord what will you have me to do today are we practicing self-denial as Jesus did are we deeply stirred within our hearts drawn out to prayer are we doing all asking the Lord to give us wisdom to work with our ability and our means to save souls that are perishing out of Jesus so I would like to ask you, in closing, are you ready to follow in the footsteps of the pioneers 
to ask daily, Lord, what do you want me to do today to hasten your coming? To pray, Lord, give me a divine appointment to speak to someone about you today. Lord, help me to improve every opportunity to, to help others to know Christ. Lord, help me to consecrate all, myself, my time, my possession, to hasten your coming. May the Lord help us. It's my prayer. Amen.